White House counted a tally of 6931, only nine votes beyond a filibuster, and the no vote count of 31 was not a figure Johnson wanted to present to the country, which is why he kept hammering Southern senators to not vote. After six hours, it was finally agreed that there would be no more delays. The time had come to vote. Senator Mike Mansfield opened the voting, and soon there were the echoes throughout the chamber. Aiken, yay! Anderson, yay! Byrd, nay! Eastland, nay! Hill, nay! Sparkman, nay! Church, yay! Lausche, yay! Hell, yay! Percy, yay! Thurman, nay! Some of the votes were uttered in even monotones, while others soared high in volume, causing necks to crane throughout the galleries. Kennedy, yay! Long, nay! When it was all over, Final tally showed 69-31. LBJ and his White House aides had prevailed to make a vote that could have been 69-31 actually turn into 69-11. Thurgood Marshall was going to the U.S. Supreme Court. Phil Hart, the Michigan senator, nearly wept. A huge smile crossed his face. All the senators who had fought for Marshall started reaching out to one another to shake hands. They had made history and they realized it. Senator Mansfield could not hold back his emotions. He glanced around the Senate from side to side. They all set their eyes upon him. Then he spoke in a voice clear and strong. Mr. President, the confirmation of the nomination of Thurgood Marshall as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court is also a confirmation of the vitality of the democratic system. It is a tribute to the good sense of Lyndon Johnson, who made the nomination, and to the judgment of the Senate, which approved it. This confirmation means that a man who loves the law and who has a firm respect and high faith in it moves to the top of his profession by entering the highest judicial body in the United States. Thurgood Marshall's rise to the Supreme Court reaffirms the American ideal that what counts is what you are and not who you are or whom your antecedents may have been. This is a shining hour, Mr. President, for Thurgood Marshall, for you yourself, for the Senate, and for the United States of America. We have come a long, long way toward equal access to the Constitution's promise. I join my colleagues in the Senate in extending sincere congratulations to Mr. Justice Marshall on this most auspicious day in his life. The White House quickly got word to Thurgood Marshall. Then the news echoed around the nation. It went from Washington to Marshall's hometown of Baltimore. It flowed into Negro barber shops and hair salons. It reached radios sitting on the edges of still segregated swimming pools in those public swimming pools that had just been integrated. It reached hot housing projects still tender from a summer of unrest that had seen riots and soldiers with rifles. It reached small southern towns where too much fear still remained in the air. It reached the offices of the old NAACP Manhattan headquarters the building that Marshall used to alight from 
to go south to try to save weary and frightened souls. The same building that had displayed the words on the flagpole to the world, a man was lynched yesterday. When the news reached him, Thurgood Marshall was overcome. He was also greatly relieved for himself and his family. I am greatly honored, he said, following the vote. Let me take this opportunity to affirm my deep faith in this nation and its people, and to pledge that I shall be ever mindful of my obligation to the Constitution and to the goal of equal justice under law. A short while later, word reached the newest member of the U.S. Supreme Court that he would have to report to be measured for his judicial robes. <laughs> This last little scene is very short, and it is um, really about um, this sort of renaissance uh, that happened for Thurgood Marshall. He seemed to be, he seemed to fall from favor, and people weren't talking about him a lot. <clears throat> And then some things happened, uh, which you'll hear in this little section. Artists and organizations have long been taking note of Marshall's historical import. In 2008, the gifted actor Lawrence Fishburne opened on Broadway at the Booth Theater in Thurgood, a one-man play which told of the justice's sweeping life. Visitors to San Francisco's Grace Cathedral could look up at the human endeavor windows and see all the windows that were named in honor of heroic figures in their craft. Albert Einstein's window was for natural science. Jane Addams's window was for social work. Robert Frost for letters. Thurgood Marshall's window for law, like the others, set up high in the cathedral nave. The church would only grant you a window if it had accepted you into the realm of sainthood. On its editorial page on March 6, 2011, the New York Times penned an editorial simply titled, The Good Marshal. It was unusual on that page to have a life revisited after the passage of so much time. It was a lovely intended tribute about the ongoing artistic homage being paid to Marshall's life. On the Supreme Court today, the editorial stated, there is no justice who seems similarly placed there to speak for the powerless by such a sweeping tide of history. There is no one whose life translates so magisterially into art. All of the attention gained Marshall new admirers. Tourists would troop out to Arlington National Cemetery to visit his gravesite. The cemetery set on land once owned by a prominent Confederate family. After the Civil War and the South's defeat, the land would be sold to the federal government. Old and bent and jubilee singing blacks fresh from the slave plantations, would trudge into Washington without places to stay, hoping their government would help them. Many who were penniless were reduced to foraging for food. They were often given housing on the site of the cemetery itself, a part of which was called Freedman's Village. These were the very people whom Secretary of War Edwin Stanton had appealed to for help during the massive manhunt to bring President Lincoln's assassin to justice. And when the final word, the final gust of breath had left the former plantation residents, they would be placed in spare wooden coffins and lowered into the earth on the same grounds 
with Thurgood Marshall, who had worked to free their descendants, would be laid to rest years later, allowing the wind to blow eternally over their gathered souls. Thank you. Thank you.